so Rashmi gave me a very ambitious title, right? Um, not sure I'm going to be able to talk about, well, or at least to give you an overview of the selective. I think I decided to go for a much more general and talk about jack inhibitors. Um, and the jack, um, jack kinases, um, just want to point out why I have to, these two pictures on my first slide. They take the name from a god, uh, Roman god Janus, right? Janus has a, got a two faces. And so you will see during my talk, I have the Roman version of the Janus god. So uh, this was actually in the Vatican Museum in Rome. And then I have the Marc Chagall versus of Janus, and that referred that when I, because it's a picture that I took at the, it's a very small part of a large Marc Chagall painting that is a Guggenheim. Uh, and when, when I saw it, I said, I need to take this and I use it in my talk. Um, and so that's when I talk about the next generation or the newest jack inhibitor, the selective jack inhibitor. Um, in any case, so um, I, I don't think I need to go through this, but um, because you know, you're both, um, both part, you know, the scientific part of the audience and uh, at the patient side of, uh, or the parents uh, side of the ocean, uh, the audience are very, very um, educated in terms of what the inflammation and inflammatory process, which involve uh, activated immune cells, which you've heard a lot about today from macrophages, T cells, and so on, and the cytokines, and they kind of sort of uh, they propagate themselves. You know, they activate each other. Uh, but my um, my area of uh, of research is actually on this this molecule called cytokines, right? That you uh, already heard about it. And um, so, and that's what my, my, my science is, is actually targeting cytokines and cytokine receptor, but uh, not all the cytokines and cytokine receptor. So over the past few years, there's been many, many uh, drugs that have been targeting cytokines. Uh, some of are listed here, and you're very familiar with anakinra, kanakinumab, or the anti-TNF, uh, the tocilizumab, which I forgot to put in red. Uh, but... Um, uh, I'm going to be focusing only on the cytokine receptor, which are called the type 1, type 2 cytokine receptor. And the reason is because for these cytokines, jacks are essentials, uh, whereas these, for the cytokines, like the TNF and uh, IL-1 and so on, jacks uh, are not used, they're not utilized. Um, so how does it work? It's a very simple, linear, very very linear pathway. Uh, I'll illustrate just the, the uh, using this this uh, the left side of the of this cartoon. So the cytokines bind to the receptor. It could be you know uh, two chains, two proteins, uh, transmembrane proteins could be three sometimes. Um, then they. Uh, when the cytokine bind, there is a conformational change of the receptor. The jacks are then uh, um, which are in close proximity. They kind of, you know, jacks are a little bit, you know, I know I've been working on that for many, many years. They're kind of stupid, you know, and I think, you know, when, whenever they, they, they find something that's changed, you know, they activate themselves and they start phosphorylating whatever they find. Uh, and the first thing they find is themselves, so the jacks, the other jacks, or, or themselves, uh, or the, uh, the, the other jacks that partner with the receptor. Then they phosphorylate the receptor, the receptor becomes the docking station for this molecule called STATS. I don't know if you heard about that, but you know, they were briefly mentioned before, the signal transducer and activation of transcription. And then STATS you know, dim uh, are uh, recruited to the receptor, they're phosphorylated by the jacks, again, being very stupid, they phosphorylate whatever they see. Uh, then they detach on the receptor, dimerize or tetramerize, go into the nucleus, and then activate the uh, gene transcription and regular gene expression. So I think the four concepts that you need to remember is that there are four jacks, jack one, jack two, jack three, and to complicate your life, tick two. Um, and then the jacks normally work in pairs. Um, different receptor activate different jacks. Sometimes the jacks is the same, sometimes is not. Um, and so there are also different stats and all of these, you know, different combination make such that you know, there are um, many different immunomodulatory signals that are generated through this pathway. And it's a very linear pathway. It's concerned from, you know, uh, from you know, drosophila all the way to mammals, you know, and, and of course, humans. Uh, but actually, stats are present even in slime molds, so even you know, lower in the, um, in the uh, phylogeny. So, um, so these are the key cytokines that you, uh, normally when you talk about uh, inflammation or autoimmune diseases in general uh, are, you know, uh, studied and, and known. So we have, you know, IL-7, 15, and so on. And these are the jacks that are being activated by all these cytokines in a kind of, you know, four different, you know, diseases, or classical uh, autoimmune diseases. And as you can see here, you know, you have JAK1, JAK2, JAK3, and TIK2. Uh, there is a, a very good, you know, reason of why you want to target these particular enzymes, these particular molecules, because they are involved in the signaling of the majority of the cytokines that are uh, involved in the pathogenesis of, of these diseases. So moving to 
your disease, SGIA, which I'm not very familiar with. I had to study a little bit. I admit, you know, I'm not, uh, I'm not exactly an expert in this, but I took this cartoon, which actually comes from a, a Peter Nikovic uh, paper uh, a few years ago, but I think it's still pretty uh, relevant. And the reason why I chose this, because, you know, this cartoon illustrates, uh, you know, some of the cytokines that you already uh, heard about this morning uh, and, you know, been discussed a lot. And these are cytokines that utilize the Jackson Stat pathway. Um, so, uh, and I think that's the reason why I'm here talking to you today. Um, so, um, how do these JAK inhibitors, which I'm going to talk to you about, work? Uh, so, as I said, um, JAKs are kinases, so they're phosphotransferases. They take ATP and they attach it to a substrate. Uh, and they do it by taking the ATP in their uh, kinase domain, that is the pocket. The ATP that you see here is this red and green uh, structure. And you know when they find the substrate, they attach the phosphate to the residue. Uh, in the case of a JAK inhibitor like tofacitinib, which uh, I'm going to talk to you more later, uh, as you can see, this is the drug, and the drug kind of overlaps exactly what the ATP does. So it, it's inserting it inserts itself in the uh, ATP binding pocket. It interacts with some of the region, you know, the hind region here. There is this residue here that it actually prevents even from ATP to uh, to to uh, to act, and therefore. That by inserting it there, the JAKs cannot phosphorylate the cytokine receptor, the stats, and so on. So all the signaling cascade and the gene regulation that is uh, generated to the pathway, it's blocked. Um, and so these are the first generation JAK inhibitor, old JAK inhibitors. Um, so uh, you, I already mentioned to you tofacitinib, the other one raxolitinib, baricitinib, and sort of pefacitinib, kind of, I think it's a middle middle generation, I would say, uh, JAK inhibitors. But what do they work? They, they work by blocking multiple jacks and so by doing blocking multiple jacks they block the cytokines uh, the, the signaling downstream of many many cytokines you know from you know the interferon the type 1 and type 2 interferon that we heard um, cytokines like interleukin 2 interleukin 4 interleukin 6 as well of course and so they block the action of some of the pro-inflammatory cytokines and also the induction of pro-inflammatory cytokines, the like induction of TNF and IL-1 that is actually mediated by type 1, type 2 uh, cytokines. So they have major effect on T cells, on B cells, and monocytes, the differentiation of uh, the so-called T helper 1, T helper 2, and T helper 17 is impaired, uh, but you know, do we really understand it very, very well? Uh, no, it's complicated. It's very complex. As I showed you before in the cartoon, there's multiple jacks, multiple stats. And so the cell and state specific dependence of any given jack for a particular cytokines is something that you know uh, we don't completely understand, which is fine with me because it means um, job security, right? Uh, we really need to, un to understand this better. Um, so this is the current status of the jack inhibitors field. So these are the jack inhibitors that are currently being approved by regulatory agencies around the world. Uh, and I'm talking about Europe, um, United States, and Japan. So the first one that was approved was raxolitinib, which is, which is a, we know it, a JAK1, JAK2 inhibitor, and it's approved for polycythemia vera and myelofibrosis, so hematologic uh, sort of malignancy. Then we have tofacitinib, and baricitinib, and pepicitinib, uh, all relatively, I mean, the first tofacitinib uh, has been, the second one been approved, I think, in 1993, uh, sorry, in 2013. <laughs> 10 years, um, and it's approved for rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, and ulcerative colitis, but these two only in the United States. Uh, baricitinib just was approved a year and a half ago or so, and it's approved for RA. Pefisitinib is interesting, it's only been approved in Japan uh, and not in the rest of the world. It's actually, that was very targeted toward the Japanese population. Then we have a very interesting drug, uh, and I wonder if anybody of you have used it, because it's actually approved for uh, canine atopic dermatitis, and every time, you know, I give a presentation of, what, uh, of you know, what? You've used it. There you go. Um, you know, I, I, somebody comes to me and say, you know what? I'm actually. <laughs> well, it's interesting that you say so because there is a, a recent uh, case report of, um, of a person that went to the dermatologist with this very severe atopic dermatitis. And the dermatologist saw it was clear completely, say, what do you do? Well, you know, I'm giving uh, this drug to my dog and so essentially this person stole the pills from the dog took the pills and cleared completely from the atopic dermatitis um, 
Um, so not something that I will suggest. Uh, but you know, I, every time I talk about this, you know, I have somebody uh, come to me and say, oh, by the way, I'm giving this to my dog and it ch completely changed the life of the dog. And actually, this was my biggest clinical success. I'm not a, a, a doctor, I'm a PhD. So, but the biggest, my biggest clinical success was actually suggesting m one of my colleagues to give uh, oclacitinib to their dog, actually two colleagues to their dogs. And they came to me like four days later, having gone to the vet and having got the medication, say, you changed the life of my dog. My dog stopped scratching, stopped, you know, <laughs> complaining, you know. Uh, in, in any case, um, so, and there is a very, you know, large market, believe me. Uh, if you have a pet, you know what you want to do if, if you, you want to uh, have your, your pet is sick. Uh, and the two of the most recent approval is Fedratinib, which is Jack one Fleet 3 um, 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 inhibitor, and it's approved again for myelofibrosis. And the last one is uh, a next gen, uh, as I call it, uh, Jack inhibitor, upadacitinib, which has also uh, been just recently been approved uh, for, for RA, and that's a Jack one selective. So, and I said, talk about uh, selectivity uh, of a Jack inhibitor. What does it mean? Uh, it's actually a very loaded question. Um, so, this is a dendrogram, very you know, of all the kinase that we have in our genome. It's 381, I think, if I remember correctly. Uh, and so the dots that you see, and this is the case for stofacitinib only, it has been tested on recombinant uh, kinase domain of all these kinases, and that's uh, the sensitivity. Uh, so you need from one to 10 micromolar to block this kinase, at the, that's a yellow dot, and then the green dot, it's just for the jacks, which are down here. But it depends on how you do the, the assay, how you measure the assay. Uh, so you you can do it in vitro, kinase assay, like that's, uh, that's the, the, what I'm showing there. You can do it in cells, you can do it in mice, you can do it in people taking the drug, and you always don't get the same answer depending on which assay you do, so it's not, it's not so straightforward. So what are these next-gen inhibitors? Um, well, uh, some of them, you know, um, you may already have heard about it, you know, the, and then Rashmi asked me to talk about filgotinib and the possibility to, to use filgotinib or a JAK1 selective inhibitor uh, in, in your disease. Uh, it's still in development. I think it's going to be just a matter of a few months for filgotinib to be approved. Uh, and then there are some that are, you know, in the process of being developed in phase three for many um, autoimmune or immune-related uh, pathologies, you know, including GVHD and so on. And then there are a couple of new one here that I highlighted in blue because actually these are interesting. This is an interesting concept. These are organ, uh, uh, well, not organ targeted, but the, the delivery and the activity of uh, of these two compounds is specific for uh, for specific organs. So this uh, this Teravans um, compound here, uh, it's actually uh, absorbed uh, taken orally. But doesn't get absorbed in the uh, in the stomach, so it actually passes in the gut, and it's only there that it's metabolized and it's acting. On it, it very it doesn't get absorbed at all, so it acts on the uh, on the um, on the cells at the gastrointestinal level, and that's why it's developed to only to use uh, for ulcerative colitis and Crohn's. And then there is this uh, other compound here that actually is given, you know, by um, spray and uh, used for asthma. Uh, but again, um, this is just a preclinical study. Uh, and so this is the, the, this is the selectivity. So we have selective JAK1 inhibitor. Uh, there are, there's one here that's actually JAK1 TIC2 inhibitor, selective TIC2 inhibitor. Very interesting uh, development for these drugs in lupus. Uh, there's a paper came out a couple of months ago about that. Um, so, um, but again, even just by blocking JAK1, you're you know interfering with the activity of many different cytokines that uses that particular uh, JAK kinase. Um, and these are the two that probably, you know, the three that I have highlighted before, so interferon gamma, IL-6, and IL-23, they were in the, you know, Peter Nigerich cartoon that I showed you before. Um, so as you can see, you can work on that by, you know, blocking JAK1 or, you know, even TIC2. Um, so there's, there's uh, uh, interest in blocking this with some. Right. Right. Yes. Yes, Jack two. Yeah, uh, the all the the first generation uh, that I showed you before block Jack two. Yeah, yes, upadacitinib, um, filgotinib, and itacitinib, which is a, a, is a, a, it's also in development. No, let me get to that in a, in a couple of slides. Okay. 
Yeah, it's very small. The, well, again, it goes back to how do you measure selectivity, right? You know, um, the, if you look at the in vitro kinase assay, yes, yeah, the, 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 the IC50 required to activate that particular, to, to inhibit that particular kinase is much higher than the other one, but you, stu you still have a little bit of activity. And in fact, if you, you know, in my slides I had before, if you take look at patients taking tofacitinib, you do see a little bit sign of anemia, right? Uh, and that's true also for, for others as well. So I think that, you know, the proof is in the pudding. When you give it to people, you kind of look, see what are really the real targets because you see them as a side effect in a certain way. Right. And then it comes back. Yes, and that's true for, and that's true for NK cells and so on. Yes. You're going too fast. I'm, I'm going to talk about that later. <laughs> because that's what, you know, what Rashmi asked me to talk about, right? So I have it in, in a couple of slides. Sorry about that. Um, no, not really. I mean, it. Right, yeah. But I wasn't prepared for her to talk about IL-3, so. <laughs> but yes, IL-3 is a JAK2, JAK2 kinase. So it's a, it's a double jack. Well, in a certain way, I will talk about IL-3, actually, to be honest. Um, so, um, because I just realized I have something on IL-3, uh, which I didn't remember. Um, so again, these are the two uh, jack one selective that are most advanced. UPA actually has been approved already, and Filgotinib is close by. So uh, a, couple of, uh, note, um, a couple of notes about uh, both upadacitinib and filgotinib. Um, so again, upadacitinib approved for RA and um, rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, and the reason why I have a slide like this, so the, the select compare was the study that was essentially used by, you know, for the approval of this, uh, of this drug, or you know, the one that eventually uh, pushed over the bar. Uh, but even with a very selective, well, relatively selective JAK inhibitors, they claim to be a JEC1 selective patient, so sign of anemia. So clearly there was a, a JEC2 that was also blocked in these patients. Um, and, but, and it's also in the, in the phase three for many other autoimmune disease. Uh, and um, for filgotinib, um, anemia was not always reported. Actually, early, early I think phase two study, uh, there was actually the opposite sign, and actually the hemoglobin levels were going up, which was very difficult to explain and understand. Uh, but that was not the case for some of the most recent uh, uh, phase three study. Um, one thing that um, I forgot to mention, I think I had it here. Uh, no, well, there were, uh, so another big concern that now people have with JAK inhibitors is the uh, F. Uh, VTE, so the thrombo, uh, venous thrombus events. Uh, it's something that it's a concern. It's a concern that was raised with baricitinib. It's probably a concern that is also true also for um, um, uh, for TOFA. And you know, one case was also uh, observed with um, um, with filgotinib. I'm not sure how this is important for little kids, but I think we need to take that into consideration as well. <sighs> I'm not sure. I don't know if we have actually goes back to the my uh, my my point I made before this uh, job security. I don't think we understand the everything that is related to, to side effects. It could be it, 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 the higher doses can you know definitely uh, seen with higher doses for sure. But um, but you know the the mechanism the mechanistic uh, reason I don't think we completely understand as we don't completely understand the elevation of you know transaminases for example and, and things like that. Um, so again, these are some of the um, adverse events and the correlation with selectivity is kind of uh, difficult to understand because as you can see, there is a drop independently. For example, if you look at NK cell number, they go down with, you know, JAK1, JAK3, which I understand. We block, you know, IL-2 and IL-15, but it, they also go down with something that it's unrelated like a JAK1, JAK2, uh, or there's no change in the case of filgotinib. Um, but if you look at, you know, um, lymphocyte number, um, some of them, there's no change, some of them, it's decreased. The hemoglobin level, uh, this is referring before, filgotinib seems to push it up, but in reality right now, the most recent data doesn't seem to uh, um, uh, recapitulate that. So, 
I think that the, the, the point is that our knowledge of the in vivo effect of all these 57 uh, molecules that use the Jackson step pathway is not complete, and we really need to to know more about it. Uh, uh, this actually, I decided to put it in because it's a it's a very very recent paper from Ian McInnes. Um, uh, and um, on um, and and so they've done this interesting study, which they took. Um, um, they used the phosphostat assay, so they measured the phosphorylation of stats as, as a sort of surrogate marker of activity of jacks. You really cannot measure jack activity in a reliable manner, so use phosphostat. And he correlated that to the pharmacokinetics of, um, of specific um, jack inhibitors. In this case, he compared baricitinib, upadacitinib, and tofacitinib, right? And, and as you can see, you look at the IC50, of the different drugs um, compared, and I have a, a box here, um, compared to the, the plasma level concentration of the, of, the, um, of the inhibitors. And so, as you can see, in the case of IL-6, uh, looking at IL-6 signaling and STAT-3, tofacitinib was the one that had the highest activity over the IC50 in the plasma. Um, and uh, whereas if you look at interferon gamma signaling and phosphostat 1, again, tofacitinib was the best. Upadacitinib, a JAK1 inhibitor, um, also was kind of came second, but baricitinib was a JAK1, JAK2, that was m not that great in terms of block, at, at the dose that was tested uh, in, in, uh, in blocking uh, the STAT1 signaling, especially if you compare it with that. But I think this is goes to your point of the IL-3 and GMCSF, right? And that's exactly the, the, what I was mentioning. Um, so if you look at, for example, a GMCSF, which is, of course, is a concern, right? I mean, at least I would think that although your, your data seems to show that these patients do not have any impaired GMCSF signaling, at least, you know, that we know, um, but the fact that a JAK1 selective uh, or so, or so selective, not so selective, like upatacitinib, is actually much stronger in blocking the GSCF. Yes, it's looking at STAT5, STAT5, GSCMCF looking at STAT5 signaling. Uh, it's much more active compared to the other JAK inhibitors in blocking uh, the G GMCSF signaling. It could be a sort of a something to keep in mind. Um, and that's true also for the IL-3, and as you can see on the, on the left side. Yeah, also for Topan. But you know, if you look at what's above the IC50, it's not that much. Okay. So, um, so this is my consideration in terms of JAK1 inhibition for for uh, SJA uh, in the lungs. So the antagonist. One thing that you have to remember is this. So JAK inhibitors block also the interferon signaling, and so and there is a well-known, um, you know, antagonistic effect between interferon type one, especially type one interferon and IL1 been described many, many years ago, and also Virginia Pasquale also uh, in the paper that was, I think was mentioned before, that this story was referring to, uh, kind of underscore. So we might be with a JAK inhibitor, we are blocking the type 1 interferon signaling, but could it be, you know, we, we be, might be unleashing a stronger activity by IL-1, something that I think we you need to be kept in mind. And also the fact that well, the data that I just showed you, the upatacitinib effect on GMCSF, you know, are probably stronger than, you know, than expected, uh, uh, considering the sup su supposedly a, a JAK1 selective, but it clearly GMCSF is JAK2 signaling uh, cytokine. So, so maybe at another day, my, my take-home message, probably going back to a pan-JAK inhibitor, slow, old school, like tofacitinib or baricitinib probably could be uh, maybe even a safer choice. Uh, again, not a clinician, uh, so I'm just, you know, looking at the data and, and considering it. Um, yes. Oh, growth hormone, okay, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. It worked. Uh, no, 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 no. I, I'm just expecting that they did some research on it. So I was talking to you before that. Okay. It's not done clinically. Okay. Went down. It's used to see what is the true growth level. Um, so yeah, right. So. Okay. Right. 
Yeah, and they grow. Yeah, their growth was. Right. Right, right, right. Right. No, I agree. And actually, I think you know, Scott made a very good point. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry that Rafael is no longer here. The net effect that was seen in the baricitinib, you know, uh, treated uh, Savi and, and, and uh, candle patient was ex exactly the opposite. They start growing again, and the anemia went away despite blocking JAK1 and JAK2. So, right. So, that, is that because you're diminishing the inflammation and therefore the patients are getting better and they start growing again? I don't know, but it's a very good point. Like I, say, I, I have no idea. It could be a way to, you know, to um, boost the growth on the, in these patients. But I think that, you know, apart from what I've just heard, um, I don't know if anybody has really done the experiment by, you know, in more than one patient and see that. Yeah, I mean, I think I have one, uh, two more slides and then I'm done, yeah. Okay, so no, I just want to give a, a couple of slides on um, tox one. One slide is on toxicity uh, because, of course, these are not you know incon inconsistent drugs. I mean, at the end of the day, they are uh, immunomodulatory, but they're immunosuppressant. So, of course, you see increased rate of infection, um, and in particular for uh, for uh, tofacitinib, uh, herpes zoster signal is clearly clearly uh, uh, something that to be taken into account. Such as, you know fact that you know. Um, patients with RA that are put on top of CD, if you're over 50, of course, you know, you recommend it to be vaccinated uh, for, for uh, zoster. Uh, and then there's cytopenia and neutopenia and, and so on, anemia, probably, you know, related to JAK2 inhibition, but also, so that the fact that we're blocking EPO, but also interleukin-11. Uh, there is an increase in leptin, um, uh, so, bro so we're blocking also the leptin signaling or and IL-6, and that results in increase in lipids, which is also seen with patients treated with tocilizumab, IL-6, uh, the lipids go up. Uh, although in the case of the JAK inhibitor, it's interesting because the ratio, you know, good cholesterol, bad cholesterol that was mentioned before, it seems that, you know, the good cholesterol, you know, it goes up um, much more than the bad cholesterol. So th there is a, a good, you know, uh, sort of a balance there. Um, and then there's some of that, you know, which I've been asked, you know, the creatinine and transaminases for which the mechanism is you know, <laughs> totally unclear. We have no idea. Uh, for thromboembolytic events, thrombolic events, I already talked about it, probably due to the fact that we're blocking uh, thrombopoietin, but again, not proved, it's a possibility. And then, you know, of course, the, the question about cancer and malignancies, I think it's too, too early um, to tell if, you know, um, uh, because there are only a few years in the, in the patients, to, but so far we haven't seen any particular signal for uh, developing of malignancy. And these are just general con consideration about this class of drugs. Uh, these are relatively new, uh, it's a relatively new class of drugs, so uh, how we consider them, you know, uh, you know, um, can we look at this drug like biologics or like steroids or something in between? Um, um, can we use them to, you know, replace steroids? Uh, I'm not sure, maybe. Um, so one thing that is interesting is that uh, um, now, at least for the use of tofacitinib in ulcerative colitis, what has been approved by the FDA is actually the a, a, a something that was not approved for RA, for example, is to start with a high dose, go on for eight weeks at 10 milligrams a day, twice a day, and then you can tape it, you need to tape it down to five and maintain your patients at five milligrams twice a day, sort of, you know, decreasing dramatically inflammation right away and then keeping it to a much safer uh, dosage. So uh, sort of what has been done with, with steroids. So the tapering of JAK inhibitor is something that it's probably um, uh, a possibility. Uh, I mean, the rest you can read yourself. We still have a lot of questions about you know, how, you know, how we can use the how we can combine with other drugs with, with methotrexate. It's been, it has been combined in many studies, but, you know, then, you know, the side effects uh, seems to increase as well. And I think we can start with the panel.